Thank you, Michael, for your kind words, friends, colleagues. What I want to talk about is today is a, is a topic that's very close to my heart, treatment of breast cancer. And, and we have been working on the concept of trying to personalize treatment for breast cancer for, for, for many years. This picture you see here, this painting, was, was, was basically went with me from the first day of my career to uh, until today it was, 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 was a painting done by one of my patients. And I think it, it shows us very clearly what breast cancer does, how patients feel when they're diagnosed with breast cancer. You see on the right side uh, the, the patient with breast still intact, no diagnosis of breast cancer at that point. The colours are pink if you can, well, unfortunately the beam has changed the colours a bit, but, but believe me it is pink. Um, the, the, the tree has leaves the patient is looking at you, whereas on the left side you can see what this patient associated with the diagnosis of breast cancer. You can see the, the, the scar of the, of, of the mastectomy. The, the clock is not only showing 5 to 12, it's actually show, showing 3 past 12. The colours are grey and the patient isn't looking at us anymore. So the diagnosis of breast cancer has, has a profound impact on, on a patient's life. And what we need to do about, with our treatment options is obviously to make sure that we can help patients better in the future. Before I start with the actual lecture, because I, I realise we are, we, are, we, are, we are quite a heterogeneous group today and some of us have medical background, others, others don't. I just want to start with some, some key facts on breast cancer that we sort of have a, a shared level of, of, of understanding before we, we go on a bit more into detail. What you can see here is the incidence and the mortality of breast cancer in the UK. And we see that the incidence of breast cancer is still rising, but at the same time we see that since the beginning of the 90s actually the mortality has gone down. And, and if we look at when I sort of started working in breast cancer, we, at that time we could cure about one in three breast cancer patients, uh, two in three breast cancer patients, and the mortality was, was about 35%. These days the mortality is down to 15 to 20%. So we've made a lot of progress over the last 15 years, but we are still not where we would like to be, and where we would like to be is that we cure 100% of patients, and that's still a, still a very important task for us to achieve. When I talk about breast cancer later on in, in, in the presentation, we have to realise we, we have very different stages of breast cancer. We have early disease, where the, where the, where the tumour is in the breast or in the lymph nodes, and we have advanced disease, where the tumour is, is, is spreading to other parts of the body. In early disease, the mainstay of treatment is surgery, localised treatment, plus radiotherapy, plus medical treatment. And these days, as I said, we can cure 80 to 85% of patients with the optimal treatment. In the metastatic setting, the, in, in the advanced setting, breast cancer can spread to other organs like lung or liver, as you can see here, or bones. In that situation, usually we cannot cure the disease, but we can control the disease with medical treatments and we can achieve control of the disease in a median of three to four years or even longer. That's the basis of the talk. What do I mean with personalised treatment? I would like to start the talk with a very simple question. You have two treatments, treatment A and treatment B. Which treatment do you think is better? It's, it's obviously kind of a trick question if you're asked that. My answer would be it depends. Clearly, treatment A has a response rate of about 80%, treatment B a response rate of about 25%, so we would say treatment A is better. But actually what we need to do when we talk to patients, we need to have a B-dimensional, we have to do factor in other parameters. What about the duration of response? If you look at treatment A, and now compare it to treatment B, treatment B works in only few patients, 25% of patients, but has a much longer effect Whereas treatment A may work in a lot of patients, but works for a shorter time. So again, is treatment A better or treatment B? <coughs> treatment B might be the better option if we could only select those patients who benefit from treatment B. Then we have a much better treatment than treatment A because it gives the patients a, a longer benefit of the treatment. What we aim for is obviously a treatment that's, that's up at 100% response and has a very, very long duration of response. What I want to address when you talk about personalised treatment in, uh, of, of breast cancer, or personalised treatment of breast cancer in general, it's two questions. How can we use the treatments we already have more selectively and therefore more effectively? So can we achieve a scenario where treatment B, rather than saying I give it to 100% of patients but only 25% have a benefit, can I select those 25% of patients and therefore have a treatment for that group that works in 100% of patients? 
And the other question is obviously, can we develop more effective treatments and, and increase a more selective and effective treatments and therefore Im improve what we do at the moment? When we want to, well, the, the way we can improve the treatment of cancer and of breast cancer in particular is understanding the biology of breast cancer. And what you see here is, 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 is a scheme that shows us key developments over the years and this slide will come back at several points in, in, in my presentation with added information. Until about the, the <laughs> 70s or, or, or early 80s even, the mainstay of, of, of treatment was chemotherapy. We didn't really have any, uh, any, any other options. Hormone therapy came only ar uh, around in, in, in the 70s and that was linked to the discovery of the estrogen and progesterone receptor which basically defined for us a group of breast cancer patients, about two two-thirds of all breast cancer patients who have tumours that are hormone sensitive. So they need oestrogen to survive and to grow and if you take oestrogen away then the cancer cells don't just stop growing, they actually die and go into apoptosis. So we found a very effective treatment for, for breast cancer but it's only for patients who carry the oestrogen receptor and that was one of the key lessons we learned over the years. We looked at the relevance of the target. If we do targeted therapy like hormone therapy we need to make sure that the cancers and the patients with the, with the cancers actually have this target. So hormone therapy works incredibly well for patients with hormone receptor positive patients. So this is for example an example where patients got treatment of five years of a hormone therapy and 15 years after 15 years there was about a 13% difference in survival for patients who had the hormone therapy as compared to patients who did not have the hormone therapy. But this is only in patients we have the target on the cancer, the oestrogen receptor. What about if you gave hormone therapy to patients without the oestrogen receptor? And the results are obviously and understandably disappointing. So there's no effect if you don't have the target. There's a huge effect if you do have the target. With the hormone therapy emerging, as opposed to chemotherapy, the question was how do we use those treatments in the best possible way for patients? And one of the pioneers of this treatment was Professor Possinger at the Charity, who happened to be my mentor, and, uh, and uh, I learned an enormous amount of him. He has been inspirational for my career, and that's, uh, and that's why I would like to mention him at, at this point. What he developed about 30 years ago, and, and these days it sounds very trivial because this is something we do on a, we use on a day-to-day -day basis, but he developed about 30 years ago one of the first prognostic scores, a very simple prognostic score using basic clinical information for patients with advanced breast cancer, this is advanced breast cancer, not early breast cancer, that tells us whether women are at high risk or low risk. And you can see very simple parameters, how quickly the cancer came back, whether it's hormone receptor sensitive and where the metastatic areas are. We used the point system to, to come up with a, with a high risk and a low risk group and we, we evaluated this, uh, validated this score prospectively a few years later and found a huge difference between patients in, in the high risk and low risk group. So a simple clinical system was able to show us within seconds when we, see, when we sit in front of the patients whether this patient might do well or whether this patient might need a more aggressive treatment. The next question we asked us was can we actually affect the outcome of patients is it important what the first treatment we give to patients in metastatic breast cancer does? So if you look at the patients in the low risk group, is there a difference whether they respond or not? And we can see that patients who respond to the first treatment do significantly better than patients who don't respond. Similarly, we see that patients in the high risk group who respond to treatment do significantly better than patients in the low risk group. But the key question is also, is there a difference between patients who respond who are in the low risk group as compared to the high risk group? So can basically response to treatment make up for the, or for, for the different biology in the first place? And what we still, what we see is if we compare patients who respond to treatment, patients who respond to treatment who were in the high risk group have a lower, have a, have a inferior outcome, have a worse <coughs> prognosis as compared to patients who had a good prognosis to start with. So same we see for patients who don't respond. So in other words, we can say that the risk classification assigned by this prognostic model persists despite response to treatment. Treatment can modify the risk, but it can't overcome it. And the next question for us was, is how important is it that patients respond to treatment? Is there a difference between the, between the different risk groups? 
We looked into whether patients in the high-risk group, whether, what, what are the most important factors for outcome for patients in the high-risk group as compared to patients in the low-risk group. And what we could see is patients in the high-risk group, what was the most important factor for their survival was whether they responded to treatment. In other words, we're a bit with, with back to the wall, and if they respond well to treatment, patients will do, will do well. If they don't respond well to, to, to treatment, unfortunately, the situation is more difficult. But what's interesting in this analysis was we also looked at patients in the low-risk group, and we found that response is not the key parameter for the low-risk group, but it's actually the tumour biology. It's what the grading is, it's the estrogen receptor status and other tumour biology parameters. So we know that in patients in the low-risk group, which is the majority of patients, the biology of the cancer remains the predominant factor that will define how well patients do with and without treatment. The next question we asked us, and, and, and we, we, we worked on this area for, for many years, is, is, is basically we, how can we use this treatment, how can we use this core to basically decide what, what treatment patients should get. And we stratify patients according to the score, uh, whether they have slow progression and mild symptoms, or rapid progression and, 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 and uh, marked symptoms. Patients with mild symptoms and slow progression, we would give single agent, agent treatment, whereas patients with rapid progression and, and marked symptoms would get polychemotherapy, so a combination chemotherapy, a more intensive form of treatment. At the same time, obviously, if the patient performance status deteriorates, we would go from polychemotherapy to single agent chemotherapy. On, on the other side, if a patient with a tumour is suddenly becoming more active and, and progresses more quickly, we would switch patients to polychemotherapy. The same applies to the choice between chemotherapy and hormone therapy. Very similar principle. If a patient has a tumour that's less aggressive, we would first treat them with hormone therapy. If the tumour is more aggressive, we would first treat them with chemotherapy and then switch to hormone therapy at a later stage. When we had, for, where did we go from there? So the next question for us is, if we have all those clinical parameters, can we improve the prediction of outcome if we use better computational methods? So in other words, what we did at this point was conventional statistics, and if we were using modern computational methods, could we actually predict the outcome in a better way? For this, we used data from several randomized trials that used hormone therapy, different types of hormone therapy, here just hormone therapy one or two, and compared them in metastatic breast cancer. We used two different ways of, of analysis. One is conventional statistic analysis, and one is something what we call a knowledge discovery techniques in, in, in databases, which is basically a, 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 an approach with several techniques from decision tree learning to artificial neural networks, Bayesian networks, fuzzy clustering, and so on. It's, it's, it's a whole array of different computer technologies used with the purpose of trying to predict the individual outcome and trying to find hidden information in the databases that we wouldn't find with, with conventional statistics. The person behind there is, 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 is a second key mentor for me. It's Professor Wisniewski from Bremen and, 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 and those who work with me closely know that we still collaborate on, on, on many things. He's a, he's a brilliant biomathematician, one of those people who, uh, who, who, although he's a mathematician, mathematician, he probably knows more about oncology than many of us. He does it in a very analytical way. He goes to all the oncology conferences and explains to me afterwards how we should interpret the data. So, so it has been very, very helpful working alongside him and, and very inspirational. Using his approach, we analyzed data from those randomized trials. And basically we looked at what are the key determinants of response? So what are the markers, what are the biological markers that determine whether a patient responds to this treatment or not? We first used conventional statistics and came up with three out of the 44 parameters in, in the equation were significant. Then we used the same data set and used the modern computational methods. We found the same three parameters, but we also found another six parameters. So we came up with nine different parameters that are determining whether a patient responds or not. The key question is again, why is there such a difference? Why do we have three parameters on the one hand and nine parameters on the other hand? And one of the things I learned from, from, from Manfred Wisniewski was that the parameters have a different level of, of relevance. We can rank the parameters with a hierarchical clustering and could basically say the first and most important parameter, for example, in this situation is, is where the metastases are. 
whether they're in the lung or liver, or whether they are in lymph nodes. Um, and, and, and we can go on like this. We have a second level, third tier, fourth tier, and the, and the relevance of those prognostic parameters will get smaller, but it's still significant. How does that work? Why does conventional statistics only pick up three of them, whereas the other methods pick up nine? One of the reasons is that conventional statistics stays on the, on, on, on the top layer. It basically looks for parameters that are relevant and significant for the entire population. <coughs> but what we realize is that some markers might be relevant for the entire population, but other markers might only be relevant for subset two. Then other parameters might only be relevant for subset 2.1, and so on. But they can be key parameters for this, for this group. And just to give you one example, we looked into body mass index, that means weight of patients, and response to hormone therapy. We always suspected that there should be a connection because in postmenopausal women, most of the estrogen is produced in, in, in fat tissue. So if someone has slightly more fatty tissue, they are likely to produce more of estrogen, and therefore there was always a, a hypothesis that hormone therapy wouldn't work that well. But when we looked at the trials, we couldn't find significance. And the explanation is here. We have three different dominant side of metastases. In two groups, and these are large groups, patients with visceral metastases, lung and liver metastases, or bone metastases, there's a significant difference for patients who are thin as compared to patients who have a higher body mass index. They do significantly better, three times, four times better with hormone therapy than the others. The reason why it's not significant for the entire population, the third group, who is odd when it comes to hormone therapy. As you can see, the response rate is twice as high as in the rest of the group, and therefore there's no difference there anymore. But if you put all patients, lump all patients in one group, we won't find significance, and that's one of the problems why, why, why we're missing out. So we used the model Manfred created and, and tried to predict outcome of patients who were not used for this model. We tried to predict outcome of, of patients from a different clinical trial. What we could do is we found basically, we looked at the actual time to progression and the predicted time to progression, whether you believe it or not, I think it's difficult to see from the back, is there are two overlaying curves. So we basically were able to predict for, for almost each individual patient pretty much pretty accurate where, whether they would respond and how long they would respond to the treatment, just based on clinical parameters. The predicted median time, mean time to progression was 312 days, observed 309 days, 880 days, 872 days. So, so, so an enormous amount of consistency between the predicted and, 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 the, calculate, and the actual terms. And we could predict response in about 96% of patients. The downside is this is only relevant for a small group of patients who have exactly the same criteria as we, as, uh, as we used. And we can't generalize those data. In order to generalize that, we need to have more information on, on, on cancer biology. And that is where the development is going to at the moment. So what we are trying to do is, is exactly what Bob Michael is saying, but in the reverse way, we are going from the clinic back into the lab. We basically take the cancer and try to understand better what drives the cancer. And again, just to, to share some, some, some basics for, for those who are not in biological sciences or medicine. The, what, what, what we're trying to do is look at different levels of cell biology that determines a cancer. We have obviously the level of the DNA. As you all know, DNA is the genetic code. In order to get from a DNA to protein, which is the end product which, which drives a cell, DNA is, is, is changed into mRNA, which is then translated into a protein. But again, protein is not the end product because protein can be in a functional status that is active or inactive. And one of the ways our protein can become active is through phosphorylation. What we will look at in the clinical data is, is different technologies to assess a cancer on the DNA level, which is genetics, on the mRNA level, which is usually called gene expression profiling, protein level, which we usually look at in pathology with immunohistochemistry, or we do phosphorylation analysis. And I think it's important to share this terminology because I will go on about this in, in the, over the next few minutes. So where I left, or we left this area was with molecular pathology, immunohistochemistry, looking at the protein levels of estrogen receptor and other receptors. The 90s were pretty much the, 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 the era of what I would call first generation genetics. Sounds interesting, but actually had no relevance for patients. And so we move on 
really to the, to, to, to the last, cent, uh, last decade, where gene expression profiles came along, basically pe people looking at the microRNA level and, and, and looking at what drives the cancer there. And we, and, and we came up with four different subtypes. These are the data that were analyzed. These are data of 534 genes in a number of patients. And again, clustering methods were used to see are there any subgroups that, that are defined by the gene expression profiles. And as you can see, there are the four or five subtypes, luminal, HER2, basal subtypes. And don't want to bore you with, with, with the details. What we're doing with this at the moment is going back to, to the old pathology classification. And we basically say we have a group of hormone receptor positive patients, majority of patients. We have a group of HER2 positive patients, which are driven by something called HER2. And we have a group of triple negative patients, basically patients who have neither one of the two hormone receptors or the HER2 receptors. Therefore, all three receptors are negative and they're triple negative patients. And that classification is becoming increasingly relevant because we have different treatments for those patients. For the patients with hormone positive, uh, with estrogen receptor positive cancers, hormone therapy is the key treatment, but we can modify it with other drugs because a lot of patients will develop resistance. For HER2 positive patients, HER2 directed therapy is the key treatment, but again, we can modify it. And for patients with triple negative, we are just developing first targeted therapies to, to improve the outcome of these patients. How this classification can really help us is, is, is something I want to show you in the next couple of slides. If you go back to the group of the estrogen receptor positive patients, so 50%, 60% of the patients, we look at at the, the gene expression types, there's a luminal A and a luminal B subtype. What's the difference between those two subtypes? Why did the gene expression profiles show us that there are two different subtypes? One observation we made over the years was that patients in a luminal A subtype are highly sensitive to hormone therapy. So these are patients who respond so well to hormone therapy that we have to question ourselves whether we should give them chemotherapy in addition for early breast cancer or whether they are sufficiently treated with hormone therapy alone. Whereas patients in luminal B are partially resistant to endocrine therapy, and this is a group of patients who should have chemotherapy in addition to hormone therapies. And, and there are new modern classification systems coming through that help us to identify those patients in the clinic that can only direct our adjuvant <coughs> treatments. But what's also important is, I mean, if you look at, this, at what drives the biology of patients in the luminal B subtype, we found that there are PR3 kinase mutations and other changes in the biology of the cancer that allows us now to use very selective treatments, whether it's an FGF receptor inhibitor, PA3 kinase inhibitors, to overcome the resistance to hormone therapy, so to treat those patients more specifically. And that's one of the advantages that's coming out from the, from the gene expression profile. So we can modify primary endocrine resistance. Another question that's, that's clinically very relevant is we have a lot of patients who respond to hormone therapy to begin with, but at some point they stop responding. And the question is really why don't they respond anymore? Why don't they benefit from hormone therapy anymore? And again, this is, this is, a, this is a, a scheme of a, of a cancer cell. We have the estrogen receptor. Estrogen binds to the estrogen receptor, goes into the nucleus, and then basically changes the, 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 the transcription and translation of genes and changes the biology of, of cancer cells. If we give hormone therapy to those patients, this pathway is switched off. And that's the way we looked at the system for many, many years. What we forgot about this is that there are alternative pathways that run parallel to this. <coughs> Other growth factor receptors that are on the cell surface that signal down and can drive the cell in different ways. And what we have learned with emerging resistance is but actually, the estrogen receptor can, rather than going into the nucleus of the cell, can go up to the other growth factor receptors, form a bond, activates them, and basically leads to phosphorylation and therefore activation of this whole downstream cascade, which tells the cell, I should proliferate, I should grow, I should live longer, don't die with hormone therapy, and invade more. So it, it creates a more aggressive type of, 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 of breast cancer as a response to resistance to hormone therapy. What makes the situation even more difficult is that through this pathway, the estrogen receptor itself gets phosphorylated and activated. So the estrogen receptor is switched on, even if no estrogen is around. And basically, we, we, we end up with a situation where a tumor was sensitive to hormone therapy, 
and is now completely insensitive to hormone therapy and can grow despite the, the presence of, of, of anti-hormonal therapy. So by learning this, we have the opportunity to address this. And for example, PR3 kinase, which is one of the, the targets up here, is mutated in about 30% of breast cancer, which means it's switched on. So if we switch off this pathway, but this pathway is still switched on, there will always be resistance. But as you heard earlier, we have now drugs that can directly take out this target and therefore switch off this alternative pathway and overcome resistance and create something what we call synthetic lethality and lead to, to, to response to hormone therapy again. Another development is, is, is looking at how well defined are our subgroups. And I mentioned to you earlier, we have the new subgroup of triple negative breast cancer, which is about 10%, 50% of all breast cancers. And many of us have only just discovered this subgroup as, as a new subgroup, but actually what we are learning is it's not just one subgroup. There are several clusters in there. If you look at the biology of those cancers, there are about seven different clusters, subtypes of triple negative breast cancer. All of them are biologically different. So we have a subgroup of 15% at most, divided into seven different subgroups. So each of them is about 2 to 3% of all breast cancer. You can imagine how difficult it is to develop treatments, but what we are learning is they are driven by different biology. For example, there's a small subgroup that's driven by the androgen receptor, behaves like hormone receptor positive breast cancer. Other subgroups are driven by DNA damage and repair as a potential target or mesenchymal subtypes is driven by, uh, by, by alkyl PR3 kinase activity or by MET as, as a different subtype. So by learning this, by understanding this, by understanding the, the heterogeneity of, of, of triple negative disease, we can develop more targeted therapies and hopefully help our patients to, to, to live better and live longer with, with, with breast cancer. Where's the journey going to? What are the next steps in terms of understanding cancer biology? And I think the next steps are next generation genetics rather than the first generation. Epigenetics, which I will get back to in a, in a moment, and maybe cancer stem cells. And just to explain to you what, 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 what we mean with next generation genetics, you all may have heard of the Human Genome Project. A multi-billion dollar, I think it was about three billion dollar, Lawrence usually knows those facts best, uh, three billion dollars spent over about 13 years, including hundreds of groups worldwide with one target to decipher the gen genomic code to decipher the human genome. It took 13 years. These days you can give us a blood sample or a tumor sample for one patient. We do it in two days. And it costs about 2,000 pounds. That's the development over the last 15 years. So we can basically from, we can sequence the whole genome of, of breast cancers within two days. It costs a lot of money. But actually, this is the way forward in, order, in, in terms of understanding breast cancer and how complex it is. This is an example of, of one cancer sample. You can see from 1 up to 22 all the different chromosomes. And wherever you have a purple line, there's material from a chromosome, from one chromosome switched to another. So you can see here, for example, from chromosome 50, material is exchanged with chromosome 12. So we realized with those modern modern analyses, but actually the, 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 the genome of, of cancer is much more affected in a way than we ever thought before, that there are multiple mutations, multiple translocations of genetic material, that every tumor is individual, and we will need to go to the individual level to understand this, because then we can treat the patients individually. How are we taking the information from the clinic back into patients? I think there are a few, there are a few challenges there for us, which are, which are more and more emerging. The first challenge, again, might sound trivial to you, but it is selection of the right patients for the right treatment. If you have a, a mixed population, we say there's a target. Some patients will have the target. I can assure you this was yellow, but unfortunately the beamer turns it into green, so I'm not completely colorblind, but, but this is that the yellow patients are the patients who have the target. The blue patients are the patients without the target. If you were giving a treatment that's aiming at a target to an unselected cord. And this is a real example from a, from a treatment I will reveal in a minute which treatment it is. We would have found a 6% benefit. Only 6% of patients would have ben benefited. We would have been the drug. Fortunately, the company who developed this, this, this product was clever enough to select the patients, which was about a quarter of all patients. And we found that the response rate, the benefit was about 25%. The drug was developed 
and it's now Herceptin, a drug we have all heard of, which is a multi-billion dollar drug, but also has saved many, many lives of patients. So by developing it in the right way, we managed to make sure that we didn't miss out an activity which was there. A lot of us, many of us think, if you do a randomized trial that's large enough, we will always see a difference. And I just want to show you one example of a treatment. You have treatment A, or treatment red, versus treatment black, I suppose. And there is a five months survival difference between those two treatments, as you can see. But that's based on that 100% of the patients have the target, 100% of the patients benefit. What would happen if only 25% of those patients would benefit, but would still have a five month survival benefit, which is huge in oncology? The curves are here, completely superimposed. If you're asking me, is there a difference between those two treatments, I say no, absolutely not. But for 25% of patients, there's a five month survival difference hidden in there, and we would miss it if we were developing the treatments in the wrong way. In order, we can still, we can still find a difference in there, but then we have to increase the number of the, uh, the, the size of the trial. So if we have a five month survival benefit, the target is there in 100% of patients. We need about 1,200 patients to show that treatment A is better than treatment B. The target is only there in 25% of patients. If we don't enrich the trial for them, we don't select those patients. We need 11,000 patients and many, many months. I can't figure out how many years this is, but it would take far too long to, to see whether this treatment works. So we need to have more clever ways of selecting patients in order to, to, to really identify those treatments. Most of modern drug development, well, most of drug development historically was done in metastatic, i.e. in advanced breast cancer. And the problem there is we have only limited access to tissue because it's not, the breast tumour is not in the breast anymore, but some of the metastatic areas are in the lung and the liver and it's very difficult to, access, to get access to this tissue. So we usually work with tissue way back from the initial diagnosis, which may have been five or ten years before. But again, what we have learned is that the tumour biology has changed significantly. So we try to take conclusions at this time point from a tumour that was taken at that time point, and the tumour we are treating here has nothing to do with the tumour we took out here. So if we want to develop treatments, new treatments, we, we, we have to change the way we're doing this. And the first and most important question is the target population defined. If it is defined, we can do what we have been doing. We go for randomised trials, small trials first, larger trials. But if it's not defined, and that's very often the case, we can go straight into a big trial, but I showed you how difficult it is and, and how we may fail. Or we can go for something what we call preoperative window studies, which I will tell you in a minute what the concept is, because this is one of the key strategies we will apply here, here, here in Brighton. So what are the new ways forward? What is our strategy here for Brighton, for breast cancer, but also for other cancer types? And we would like to focus on, on, on a few areas which are strategic aims. First of all, we want to identify novel targets and we want to look for something called synthetic lethality. Two main areas, one DNA damage and repair, the other area cancer epigenetics and I'll explain to you in a minute why we chose those areas. We also need better biomarkers to tell us something about the biology of the cancer because I told you the cancer biology is changing over time but well, we need a way to find out what the biology is at the point in time when we try to treat a patient. And one of the, uh, the, one of the biomarkers we're working on with is plasma DNA. And we need novel concepts to basically bring the treatments back into the clinic. One of them is preoperative window studies, and again, more in a second. Synthetic lethality is, <coughs> sounds a bit drastic, but it's, 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 it's the new fashion term in oncology. And, and basically what it means is, I always compare it with, with, with a table. A normal table has four legs. If we cut off one leg of a four leg table, it's still standing. If you have a three leg table and we cut off another leg, it'll fall. That's the concept of synthetic lethality. So a normal function, four legs. Some cancers, however, have a compensated disturbance. So one of the legs is cut off as part of the cancer process. If you then find a treatment that cuts off another leg, that doesn't affect the normal cells with four legs but affects the cancer cell with three legs, and therefore we create something called synthetic lethality. The area where it was first demonstrated was in DNA damage repair in patients who had tumours that were deficient for so-called BRCA, BRCA gene, which basically affects DNA damage and, and, and repair. A normal cell has a way 
single-strand repair as well as double-strand repair, two ways of repairing damage of, of the DNA system. In a bracket efficient cell, one of the systems is switched off, but the cell, cell is still viable. We, are, on the other hand, try to develop treatments that switch off single-strand repair, and that can be done with PARP inhibitors. And again, if we, if we switch off single-strand repair in a cell with normal double-strand repair, the cells can compensate for this. But what happens if you put both things together in a bracket deficient cell, uh, cell, which is a rare genetic form of breast cancer, the cell has no way of compensating for this and the cell dies. The cancer cell dies, whereas normal cells in the patient are not affected. We've created synthetic lethality. What we're working on now, hopefully over the next few years, with the, with the Genome Center, as you all know, it's one of the leading institutes in Europe on, on, on basic biology of DNA damage and repair, we want to identify new targets for DNA damage and repair and bring them and look for synthetic lethality. We will look at in tissue and in cell lines whether those targets are affected. We have chosen a programmatic multidisciplinary approach to do this. We will look for, with a new high throughput sRNA facility which we are creating over the next few weeks, we're actually interviewing tomorrow for the, for, for the lecture for this, to look what is synthetically lethal with some of the novel targets that have been identified in the Genome Center. We do this in a, in a, in a, in a joint way. We, we bring together the, the basic science expertise. And here you just fi find a list of some of the targets that have been selected with basically the champion of the, of, of, of the target, the scientist who knows everything about the biology. Whereas on the right side, you find a more generic translational research group where we basically bring all our expertise together in how to bring this into the clinic and how to turn this into, in, into drugs. We have an amazing setup here in, in, in Brighton. We have, we have the basic science in the, in the Genome Damage and Stability Center. We have structural biology with, with Lawrence Pearl here that can basically identify what, what the, the three-dimensional structure of, of, of some of those targets. We have Simon Ward here, a new professor of drug discovery that can, who can develop specific drugs targeted, for those, for, uh, targeted against those defects. Um, and, and with the clinical element, here in, in the medical school, we can bring it all together and be a very efficient way of developing new treatments to target DNA damage and repair and to create synthetic lethality. So I think we're in a un unique position to do this, and this is a programmatic approach that will take place over the next few years, and the first steps have, uh, have really been made. The second area where my lab is focusing on is cancer epigenetics, and I, uh, I spoke a lot about genetics, and genetics is the change in the code of the DNA. Epigenetic means it's a change to the DNA without changing the code. So the actual DNA sequence is exactly the same, but there are, the cell has mechanisms to switch on or switch off certain areas in the genes. As you can see here, we have, we have, we have some areas are methylated, which is like a little cap over the DNA. If this cap is there, the gene is silenced, and the gene can't, can't be translated into, in, into a protein. So DNA methylation silences genes, it affects multiple pathways, it affects pathways in, in, in multifunctional areas, and what is most important is these changes are dynamic. They can, they can occur within days, within weeks, rather than over years what genetic changes do. One of the areas, just to give you an example of what we can do with epigenetics, is, is looking at, at amino acid syn uh, synthesis. And we have shown in different cancer types so far that there's an, uh, there, there's an amino acid called arginine, and this is produced by an enzyme called ASS1. Normal cells, they can produce this, but in some cancer cells we found that ASS1, the producing enzyme, is very low. That's not a problem for cancer cells because arginine is absolutely everywhere and the cell will just use it from external sources and, and, and live happily on. What happens if we take away the arginine in those cells, if we take away the arginine, the surrounding arginine, the arginine in the blood? Well, most cells will just upregulate ASS and therefore produce more. But what we've, what we've learned is if ASS1 is methylated, it's switched off. The cells can't upregulate it. So if we take away arginine, the cells will ultimately die. This is therapeutically relevant because there's a drug out there which is called arginine deaminase, and what it does is it breaks down arginine in, in, in the blood, which has hardly any toxicity to normal cells because all normal cells can produce arginine, but some of those cancer cells can't and will die selectively. So a new way of looking into this and, and what we want to do 
is look in a more programmatic way into epigenetic regulation of DNA damage and repair, but also of amino acid uh, me metabolism, just to, 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 to mention two, two targets. I promise to talk about new biomarkers, and, and plasma DNA is one of the key biomarkers, in, in, in my opinion. As we, as, as we said before, access to tumor tissue is difficult, but what we've learned is that we can take blood samples from patients with cancer and basically find epigenetic or genetic changes that are derived from the cancer, we can find them in blood samples. So we can find a fingerprint of tumor DNA in the blood samples at the same time. So tumor sheds some of its DNA into the blood and we can use that. We can use that in the metastatic setting and basically this gives us a simple means for assessing changes, which is relevant because if you look at epigenetic changes, they will change over time. So we started a, we started a, a, a few years ago a large international biomarker study that basically uses samples, tissue and blood from 700 patients internationally where we correlate what we find in blood with what we find in the tumour and we'll try to predict the clinical pathological features as well as outcome in a static and a dynamic way. We have, our aims are to establish a clear link between blood, or the results from blood and tumour, but also to come up with a diagnostic fingerprint. In other words, can we come up with a classifier from epigenetic changes from blood that are diagnostic of breast cancer? So if you have a patient, you give me a blood sample, if you're able to do this, we will be able to say whether this patient has breast cancer or not, if it's sensitive enough, from a, from, from a fingerprint from, from, from the blood samples. We can also use it as a, as, a, as a tumor marker and as a predictive and prognostic marker. And just to show you how relevant this can be, is, is results from, 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 from a couple of patients where we basically looked at several genes. U stands for unmethylated, M for methylated. And we looked at before the treatment and after two cycles. And as you can see, after only two cycles, there are changes in the methylation profile. The genes we looked at are genes that are relevant for resistance. So after two cycles, we already find resistance patterns being switched on. And that's important for us to know because then we can stratify patients and, and give patients at an early stage a different treatment. What might be also very interesting is, is what we show here, very, very preliminary data, data from seven patients, not patients, I should say, healthy women, who are, because of a family history, at high risk of having breast cancer. And we looked at a gene that's methylated in breast cancer, and it's usually not methylated in, in, in healthy volunteers. And as you can see, we found that this gene was methylated in two out of, out of five, out of seven women. What we don't know is this subclinical breast cancer. Do we detect breast cancer very early? Does it show us something about susceptibility? But obviously, it, 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 it might be a technology that can help us in screening, if it's sensitive enough, to be added to mammography and tell us which patients might have subclinical breast cancer or might develop breast cancer over time. Last point I wanted to address is, is, is really how can, we, how can we bring those new treatment options back into the clinic? And one model I've, I've been talking about now for, for some time is, is preoperative window studies. What we basically mean is we treat women who have been diagnosed with breast cancer with a breast cancer, with a tumor still in the breast, we give them treatment before we operate and see how the cancer changes. Normally, what we, what we, over many years, what we did was we gave the treatment for four months and then looked at whether the cancer became smaller. If the cancer became smaller, we knew the treatment was effective. But again, what we've learned is we can actually take a, a sample of the cancer only two weeks after the start of the treatment, and if if the cancer growth rate, the cell growth rate in this sample changes after two weeks, this is very much correlated with the response after four months and can be used as a predictor of outcome. So rather than waiting for four months, we can treat patients for two weeks, see how the cancer biology changes, and then know, can extrapolate those data and know whether a patient responds to the treatment or not. And this is exactly what we're doing in a, in a study that's just about to start here in Brighton which is an exciting project for all of us. It's also an exciting project of semantics, and, and I see that Leslie is smiling. This trial was initially called the SPIKE trial. Uh, I thought we, were, we, we thought we were very clever uh, because we used all the different names in the title. It's a very long title of short-term preoperative treatment with the PR3 kinase inhibitor and so on. Came up with the title of SPIKE. 
Um, everyone was excited about, uh, about, this, about this title um, until Leslie at some point when we actually had already submitted it to ethics and had it passed through ethics that this isn't such a great acronym for a trial where you take a lot of biopsies because spike <laughs> and biopsy doesn't go together. So I said to the team, please come up with better ideas. We had, we had, we had, we had some very, very good ideas. I'm, I'm still thinking about the ideas Charles came up with, which I don't want to mention here. Um, but uh, but uh, someone came up with opportune. Don't ask me how we found opportune in, in the title, but this is an acronym sort of produced of some of the letters in the title of the study. So rather than spike, it's the opportune trial. But what we're doing is we, we have patients with primary breast cancer, cancer still in the breast. They will be randomized to hormone therapy or treatment of hormone therapy with a PO3 kinase inhibitor, which I mentioned before, can overcome resistance to, to endocrine therapy. We take a biopsy before we start the treatment. Another biopsy is taken at surgery after two weeks. And then we use that to compare the growth rate of the cancer, we count the number of dead cells, we look at the biology, we try to work out exactly who are the patients who benefit from this treatment, we do all this genetic, transcriptional and phosphorylation profiling to, to tell us exactly who, who has the benefit, and we also try to understand why some patients don't benefit of this treatment. This is a protocol, it's a study that's led by us here in, in Brighton, but we obviously can't do it on our own. We do it with Bart's Hospital, with Guy's Hospital, and, 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 and together with Dundee, because it's, it, it's a large trial of about 150 patients. Where do we want to go with this? Well, ultimately, our hope is that we do trials that are similar to this concept, where we have randomized patients to a standard therapy, and then get to a situation where we can come up with a classifier that tells us profile A, B, or C, and then give treatment A, B, and C. Very specific, very individual treatment. And I'm sure we can do better than standard treatment, which is usually just, just a treatment by, by chance, whether patients respond or not. To do all of this, we need to have access to patients. We need to work together. There are challenges associated with, with, with the new biology of, of, of cancer medicine. If you just think back to triple negative breast cancer, 15%, now divided maybe in six or seven subgroups, 2% of, of, of breast cancers. If we want to do targeted therapy, we need to think bigger. We can't just work as isolated little cancer centers anymore. And one of the key things is the experimental cancer medicine center. So we require a large network. And I think we're all proud to say that, that, that we have just been awarded experimental cancer medicine center status. So we are now on the map as a joint center together with, with BARTS, BARTS Brighton uh, Experimental Cancer Medicine Center. What is this? It's a joint initi initiative by the Cancer Research UK and by the Department of Health. Uh, it's a network to position the UK really as the, as, as, as the leading nation for early clinical trial and sustainable research. And it will provide infrastructure in those centers that basically we can run those trials uh, efficiently. Why BARTS? Why us? Well, we wanted to bring together two large, well-functioning func cancer centres. And by doing this, we have a population, a catchment area of about 3.5 million, rather than about 1.3 million, which we would have on our own. And that gives us a lot of power to do interesting in research with high impact for patients. Jointly, we have about 50 team leaders. We have overall about 450 researchers between the two sides. We spent about 22 million on, 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 on or well, we, we earned 22 million, which we then spend on, on, on research every year. And we feel with this, we have the critical mass for doing high impact research. We agreed to lead on different areas, and we from Brighton will lead on breast cancer and lung cancer, and, and, and maybe head and neck over time as the key strategic aims for us in terms of oncology. So this is the journey I've taken over the last years, and I come back to, to the initial picture of a patient. And I think with all the developments we have, we still have to keep focus on the patient. And what, I, what we realize every day in the clinic is, is the more treatment options we have, the more challenging it gets to actually make the patient understand what we're talking <coughs> about. And I'm looking at Leslie because her group has done amazing work around our communication with patients and has really led the scene and, 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 and helped us as oncologists to understand and to learn and to better communicate with patients. And this is something that helps me on a day-to-day -day basis because this is, this is critical if we want to look after patients in the best possible way, that we don't just know our facts, but we can also talk to the patients. The acknowledgements didn't want to come up. Um, this is obviously something where 
which you can't do on your own. We need to have a large team. We have a, an amazing team here, a functioning team. And I discussed with several people how basically can we acknowledge everyone's input. It is impossible because I, I, I sent John a, 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 a couple of slides yesterday with a, probably about 100 names on there. And he quite rightly said, you may want to ignore my advice, but I think this is a bit too long. Uh, so uh, I, I had to uh, basically just group it into, in, into different themes. And obviously, uh, we, we have a, a, a fantastic oncology team here, which is one of the reasons why, why I wanted to come here, because it's, it's, it's a functioning team. We all work together. We meet each other every Monday and, 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 and can therefore act together as, 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 a, as, a, as a functioning collaborative group. The breast cancer team, some of, the, some of you are, are here as well, again, is, is critical for me for my personal research interest. And we're just pulling together everything we have to do this, this opportune study. And I think it, 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 it's, it's fascinating to see how the team is coming together and how we, how we hopefully will run this trial very soon. Siri is our clinical investigation and research unit, dedicated clinical trials unit, which again is one of the top units in terms of the infrastructure and staff we have here, this, 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 this is at least as good as what I saw in, in, in London and enables us to, to, to do the work. Sure, I've mentioned uh, Leslie Fallowfield's group, which again has been inspirational for many years. The Genome Centre and University of Life, of, of Life Sciences is, is what we work together on DNA damage and repair and on the drug discovery, drug discovery programme. We have our imaging centre, BAS, I think I mentioned, and, and not last but not least, I obviously want to mention the Cancer Network and the Cancer Research Network, which again are, are important for us to, to, to pull our strength together. There are a lot of external clinical people I, 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 we work with and I work with personally. Some of them are mentioned here as groups. I don't want to bore you with, with going through all, all, all the details. And, and obviously my lab team here, I want to say thank you for all the hard work they're, they're putting in. And also Natalie, who I forgot to, uh, to, to, to thank you, uh, uh, last time we, we, we had a presentation when we celebrated, her, when we set up our lab, who was very critical when we set up the lab here, and, and we are very grateful for this. At the moment, we receive funding from several sources, and, 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 and Michael said at, at, at the beginning that, that, that a great thank you also, obviously, to, 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 to Michael. Without him, we wouldn't be here today because we wouldn't have had basically the, the, the resources to, to fund the chair and fund, fund, fund the work we are doing. So thank you very much for this. That's what I wanted to share with you as a vision of cancer, but also where we've come to, but at the end of the day, where we want to go to. Thank you very much for your attention.